There are a number of ways whereby HIV can penetrate through blood vessels to reach its target population. It shows two different entities, both HIV and its main target cell, which is the CD4 lymphocyte. The virus has an outer layer, and the outer layer, as you see, contains a number of spikes. These spikes include the major glycoproteins of the virus that are responsible for direct interaction with the cell surface. You can also see the matrix core, which exists in the symmetrical shape of an icosahedron. You can see that structure of HIV is very, very complex. There is a lipid membrane, and from that lipid membrane, you can see that the spikes protrude outward. Uh, these include the surface glycoprotein, which is GP120, as well as a transmembrane glycoprotein that is termed GP41. The matrix core, the capsid protein, and the nucleocapsid protein all underlie the outer layer of the virus. And finally, in the inner core, you see that there are two strands of viral RNA, which are associated with three of the enzymes that are essential for virus replication. These are the integrase, the protease, and the reverse transcriptase this attachment stage clearly indicates how the GP120 is about to bind to its CD4 receptor. In fact, we know that there are other receptors as well that can be involved with HIV entry into target cells. We term these other receptors the co-receptors, and there are actually two of those. One of these is termed CCR5, and the other is termed CXCR4. And these are responsible, actually, for the entry of viruses into lymphocytes and macrophages, respectively. This is the process of co-receptor binding following the interaction of GP120 to the CD4 receptor, which is the major receptor for viral entry and penetration. And this binding event that involves GP120 to CD4 actually changes the shape of the GP120. And now this results in the exposure of a portion of the transmembrane glycoprotein, GP41. And so GP41 is important in bringing the HIV virus much closer to the target cell, resulting ultimately in the fusion of the viral envelope together with the fusion of the cell membrane. And this then is essential in viral entry the transformational change can take place within GP41 as a precursor event in this fusion process. It is essential to point out, therefore, that each of GP120, the CD4 receptor, the CCR5 or CXCR4 receptor, and GP41 are all essential elements in the process of viral entry into target cells. This is the actual fusion process whereby the outer surface of HIV, notably its envelope, can fuse with the CD4 cell membrane. And you can see that one of the consequences of this is the entry of the matrix core of the virus into the host cell cytoplasm. The matrix core can actually become uncoded, and this will result in the disintegration of this core and the release of the capsid inside the cytoplasm together with the genome of the virus, that means the viral RNA, as well as associated enzymes, which can now go to work to initiate the process of viral replication within the host cell. This viral RNA is now exposed in the host cell together with the enzymes, and the two coded viral RNA strands that represent the genetic makeup of the virus can now couple together with the reverse transcriptase enzyme. And in addition to this, the integrase enzyme and the protease enzyme of the virus are also released into the cytoplasm. At the same time, the viral nucleocapsid protein will begin to disintegrate at this stage, and this results in the exposure of naked strands of viral RNA. These naked strands of RNA will now undergo conversion into viral DNA, and this is a process that is mediated by the viral reverse transcriptase enzyme. This is an extremely important step in the viral life cycle because this is the point at which the drugs that block reverse transcription can begin to take effect. 
It is the formation of a first strand of HIV DNA. And this results then from the reverse transcriptase enzyme being able to move along the viral RNA and read its sequence. And in the process, what we have is the assembly of a copy of viral DNA. As this takes place, the viral RNA actually becomes disintegrated by a different portion of the reverse transcriptase molecule than that which is involved in the copying of the genetic information for viral RNA into DNA. It shows the formation of the second strand of viral DNA. And this means that as the first DNA strand is completed, it now actually serves as a template or basis on which to copy a second strand of viral DNA. And this second strand of viral DNA that is made is actually complementary to the first strand that was made. This is likewise an essential step in viral replication, and this step as well can actually be inhibited by the reverse transcriptase inhibitors. The entry of the viral DNA into the nucleus is a very important process in the viral life cycle, and you can see the double-stranded HIV DNA migrating into the nucleus of the host cell. This is followed by the process which is termed integration. This process is mediated by yet another viral enzyme termed integrase. And what this enzyme does is actually to slice through the DNA of the host cell, permitting the viral DNA to be inserted at a variety of sites in the viral DNA of the host cell. And unfortunately, once this happens, it is fair to say that the cell has been infected for life. This is the transcription of HIV genomic RNA. What happens now is that the DNA which has been integrated is now called a provirus and can now be used to generate genomic RNA which can serve as messenger RNA for the synthesis of viral proteins. In fact, the provirus of the DNA as represented by viral DNA may remain dormant over very long periods until the cell becomes activated. This, alas, is one of the most difficult issues that we have to contend with in terms of trying to deal with the HIV infection. Because once a cell has been infected by HIV, it is infected for life. This is the transcription of the viral messenger RNA, which is made from the proviral DNA. And as we said before, the viral messenger RNA is essential for viral protein synthesis and you can see the construction of a number of different messenger RNA molecules of several different types. It now shows the migration of the viral RNA and of messenger RNA out from the nucleus back into the cytoplasm. And it is in the cytoplasm that we actually have the formation of viral proteins. This is how viral proteins actually get made in view of the fact that ribosomes can move along viral messenger RNA molecules, and the formation of viral proteins will then ensue as a consequence of the juxtaposition of these viral messenger RNA molecules together with the ribosomes. And now, a very important event in the viral life cycle, notably, the viral proteins as they are made are actually first produced as precursor proteins that are not themselves active in any real sense. In other words, these precursor proteins are not actually able to function within the viral life cycle to give rise to finished virus products. What is required, rather, in order to get a virus that will be infectious, in order to reinitiate a new cycle of infection, is that the viral protease enzyme actually cuts these long precursor proteins or polypeptide chains into smaller individual subunits. And this process, in fact, continues even after new virus particles have formed and have butted off from the host cell. The process of viral assembly shows how the viral matrix will form to envelope the various protein segments and two strands of viral RNA. This is the stage at which the viral envelope glycoprotein complex that consists of GP120 and GP41 actually gets inserted into the host cell membrane. This stage reveals the very important process of budding, whereby an immature virus particle will bud out from the host cell membrane.
The process of viral protein cleavage by the protease enzyme is a part of viral maturation and will continue even after the budding has actually taken place. The last step in the virus life cycle is the maturation of new virus. The newly mature virus particle is now infectious and contains the various components associated with ability of the virus to initiate a new infection event. The new infection event will, by definition, involve the ability of this newly made virus particle to attach to a new, previously non-infected cell. And of course, this will require that each of the capsid core, the two nucleocapsid proteins, the two strands of viral RNA, two molecules of reverse transcriptase, two integrase molecules, and two protease molecules all be part of this newly assembled virus particle in order that a new cycle of virus replication can be reinitiated.